I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. Red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fang claws coming out through. Three inches long, you know, just sharp as they could be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. I almost stopped recording. Don't stop recording. I That's the whole thing. I leaving a long time ago, so, you know. That, uh, yeah, I, who even, is that Journey? Yeah. Okay. Is that Journey? Yeah, Brandon. I never liked Journey. Uh, I never don't liked. Stop believing is a classic. I never liked most things from the eighties. How are we friends? I don't know. Like, cause like, <laughs> cause like, Brandon, like, that's kind of my thing. Yeah, like the eighties are like literally like one of my. Like, look around my fucking room in the fucking... Like, I'm surrounded by 80s. Yeah. At all times. Yeah. Also, technically, Journey is a 70s band. Is Journey a 70s? Well, they probably existed. They like, they were active from 73 to 87, then 91, and then 95 to the present. When well, they should just stop did, now. When did they make... Um, don't stop believing like whatever yeah. their biggest hit was is what decade they belong to in music 81 81 okay so I think in- that's their main hit right because they also do the like just the, any way you want it just the way you need it any way you know oh i hate that song too <laughs> it's all terrible banana <laughs> get a copyright strike because i'm so good that's never uh, gonna happen ever any way you want it was uh the first signal it, it peaked at 23 in 1980 so i guess that's still 80s they're pretty squarely 80s like all their most popular ones are basically 80s yeah okay all right man they had seven years of like no hits but then again i guess there's a lot of bands that have all the years no hits so there's, I'm trying to, what year, what, um, I'm trying to think when, is that, what, what year was Zappa in the, uh, in the Mothers of Invention? Oh, I don't know that one. I don't if know. If they were 80s, year. that might be like the one 80 band, 80s band that I like. The Mothers of. Yeah. Wait. Wait. Is it the Mothers of Invention? Or the mothers of prevention. Not prevention. Invention. They're all okay. let's see. Joe's Garage was uh, 79, 79. 67. Yeah. They were not active in the 80s at all. It's all 70s. Yeah. All I like 70s steady. stuff. That's fair, that's fair. And then like I'm not as big a fe- fucking seventies fan, so you know, there's that. Yeah, and then we were both born in the nineties. Oh, it's perfect. It works out perfect. When did the original run of Star Trek happen? Uh, let's see. Star. I think Trek. it was definitely sixties. Ah, sixty six to sixty nine. Yeah. So that almost was everything seventies for you. Yeah. Um. Jeez. The uh, uh, what was I gonna say? I don't know. Um. Did Did I tell you about Did I tell you about the fact that the new Magic set is Dungeons and Dragons themed? You did. I don't recall if that was on air or off air, but yeah, I think they should do a uh, a D and D theme one. But they should also do a, a um ah what was that one uh where it was it was like D and D but funny uh, Adult Swim um he had that like uh, a familiar Tigtone Tigtone yes they should make Tigtone I, they're not gonna do Tigtone because like th- that would be require licensing i mean they're actually doing a warhammer set soon and they did do they did do a secret lair drop with walking dead okay wait what are other yeah. wizards properties uh hasbro properties you should say 
Oh, it, it, Hasbro owns Wizards of the Coast? Yeah, so anything Hasbro goes. Because, like, there are My Little Pony Magic the Gathering cards. You, you I know. hate that. Uh, I Twilight hate Sparkle, that. the Princess and Nightmare, I think. I forget what the princess's name was. Princess Luna? Fuck, I hate that I remembered that. Oh. Um, so I had, like, a Mandela moment, by the way. Okay. Watching, uh, th- that, that just reminded me, talking about, uh, My Little Pony. Um, I had a Mandela moment, and I was not alone in Okay. It. Christina shared this moment with me. What was it? Um, we were watching, we were watching, uh, Loki, and- Okay. Are you caught, um, are you done? Did you finish it? I'm done, I'm done. Okay, I'm done. okay. But we're not we're not gonna talk about it on there. Um I was watching Loki in Miss Minute, I thought was Applejack. The voice. voice actor? Oh yeah. that's and like because she sounded identical to Applejack. Yeah. And it was Tara Strong. I'm like, oh yeah, Tara Strong was in My Little Pony. And like for whatever reason, I'm like, oh yeah, definitely, 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 definitely. Um Brandon. Brandon Tara Strong voiced Twilight Sparkle. She didn't voice Applejack, so I'm super confused. There's it. I never connected any of those dots, but now that you say it, it was very My was Little very Pony Applejack. voice. Yeah, it was very Applejack, and I hated it. Well, I I actually no, that's not true. I loved it because Applejack is Christina's least favorite My Little Pony character. Why so Applejack's const- like the best? You were a you were a simp for Rainbow Dash. Rainbow Dash is actually the best. Yeah, you were you were a Rainbow Dash simp, so don't even come at me with that. Um, but uh, yeah. So like, <laughs> I was me- like the entirety of the series, I was messing with her. <laughs> um, and really, so you were fun. messing with yourself. Ah, uh, no, no, no. I don't care is the trick um the also speaking of weird shows i'm all over the place today i don't know why yeah. i'm usually all over the place though so i guess this is pretty much par for the course for me um have you heard about sexy beasts on netflix i have not what okay so google sexy beasts netflix please Just yes real quick just real real quick Oh, I feel like this, wait a minute, this could either be very much my thing or very much the opposite of my thing, depending on (laughs) what way the show takes it. Okay, okay. Is the point to make the most disconcerting, like, the weirdest shit, like, is it, makeup artists makes this shit and they just send that like, to an elevator and whoever weirds out the most people wins, or is it not that? It's a dating show. Yeah, so this is very not my thing. So, Christina, I watched four episodes of it last night. I suspect I'm going to watch some today. It was... So, I wouldn't call the show good. Here's the thing, right? Um, It's not a good show. It's terribly cut and edited. But the human tragedy that is this show is inescapable. (laughs) <laughs> continue um basically the premise of the show is you get four people together each episode one person is the person who's like picking people and then okay. the other people are like like candidates so it's like miniature bachelors that are yeah. in one episode the twist though is everyone's wearing extremely heavy makeup that makes them look like animals. Now, here's... I have a question, though. Do Are they doing their own makeup? Or is it... There is a no. makeup... So, it's a dating show where the, so two people get paired up, and then they go to separate makeup artists who do this bullshit to them, and then they have to go on a date like this? Well, no. So, not even that. They get four poor souls. Do okay. makeup to all four of them. I have no idea how they decide what the makeup is whatsoever. Um, but they get four souls, put makeup on them, and then, uh, they have them do a speed date, right? 
One yeah. of them gets disqualified, and then they reveal their face, right? Okay. Then they do another date, and the person picks their sexy beast who's going to win. Yeah. And then they reveal what the person looks like, and then they reveal what the person they didn't accept looks like, and then yeah. they reveal the person who they did accept. What? This? They should just mash this up with Love Island and call it a day. It's it's uh, it's, it's to, to paint a mind a mind picture for people listening. All of the makeup look like uh, um, the the creature people from the TV show Grimm. Like they all look like they could be on that show. The beaver is the most upsetting to me, or the, the dolphin. I'm really not sure which. The the dolphin I find the most upsetting. The beaver and the fox look like they're actually, and the mask look like they're actually from the show Grimm. Um, chicken person looks like he's in a really high value, um, like porn version of um, Foghorn Leghorn. <laughs> right? <laughs> it looks like it's a really high budget porn parody of Foghorn I hate, Leghorn. I hate what you just said, but you're right. Yeah, You're right. I mean, the whole thing looks like a high budget porn parody. To be totally honest, though, that actually, yeah, that nails it. Except the dolphin. Everything, no, that's high budget porn. The that's dolphin high budget. Stands out. That took, right there, that dolphin. That's the like fringe shit. Is it what that is. Took me a while to realize that thing in the middle was a blowhole and not like a jewel embedded in the forehead. Um, but everyone on the show is terrible. They're all terrible, and they're all children. They're like yeah. 21 to 24. That's so young. Oh, yeah. And, like, like they're, like, one of them was talking about, like, getting married and, like, how they were going to find their husband on the show. What? It's two dates, Brandon. It's It's two dates? It's two blind dates. Also, there's some interns at work, and I have nothing in common with 21 year olds. Like, oh other, no, other no. than other than anime, yeah, that that's literally it. I can't relate to the younger. I can't relate to the youth. I can't. The youth, they didn't even, they didn't even, they don't, don't even use CDs. Like, they never had to use CDs. I mean, I don't use CDs anymore. But that, I don't like, anymore. Oh, actually. That's a lie. I have a Streetlight Manifesto, The Hands That Thieve album in my car, I believe. No. Yeah. Somewhere in between. Somewhere in between. I have one copy of Somewhere in Between in my car that I leave as, like, my... If my phone is dying or almost dead, I switch over to that as my emergency music. Yeah. They, because Streetlight Manifesto is always good, but that's they, a whole They've thing. never experienced the difference between anti-skip CD players and regular CD players. <laughs> they like that's just they just haven't we're we're kind of so we're a transitory generation us millennials though so like we yeah. kind of we're kind of different because we've experienced like so many different varieties of technology oh yeah because like we started with cassettes we existed during the entire reign of cds we had mini discs oh, yeah. potentially. We had like I had the Harry Potter books on cassette, so I could listen to them on cassette. Uh, yeah, we're we're, the, we're we're transitory. We're generation. We we they, other people will never experience Zooms or HD DVDs. Listen, dude. <laughs> I still got my fucking Zoom right here. You still have your Zoom? Look at that. I don't. I can't charge it anymore because I don't have the proprietary charger for it anymore. But I got my Halo Two Edition Zune. Oh, Hell Halo yeah. Three. Sorry, my Halo Three Zune right here. Yeah, like they, they'll never know Zunes. I've got, um, I've got lots of HD DVDs that I can never watch again because Blue yep. Blu Ray one. I chose, I chose incorrectly on both Zune and HD DVD. I don't think you chose incorrectly on Zune. Zune is superior to an iPod. I do still believe Zune is superior and that they're they 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 were both phased out by just phones. Well, yeah, phones became just because like it used to be the the music player you chose, like the aesthetics of it had a huge play in like had a huge play in like why you chose it. Too. Yeah. Um. 
but man, I'm I'm looking at this this Zune right now, and like I'm so glad I haven't gotten rid of it. It's just beautiful to look at. It's a shame that I'll probably never be able to turn it on again, though. There's, I'm sure you can on eBay find just like Zune chargers, or go yeah, to some like I... estate sales or something. But Brandon, that's that's more money than I really feel like spending. One and two, I can't access Zune. I can't access Spotify on my Zune, so like. I'm post owning music too, unless like I really like the music, so it's kind of like whatever. Oh, I'm the same. I'm post physical media, um, yeah. with the exception like the new Pokemon games I'm getting on physical media because My I want that. I I always get Godzilla movies on physical media. Fair, and that's mainly because Godzilla movies are a nightmare, a rights nightmare. So I'm not fucking around with that. Yeah, if it's something you're going to want to watch, like, a few years from present, then you should own it on physical media because you don't know what's going to happen with the licensing between Although now and should, the future. You should make digital copies of it because, um, so, like, data rot is a thing, just as a heads up to everyone. Um, anywho, we should probably start the episode. We've been talking about random ass shit for long enough. Yep. Um... But, like, I feel like people have just come to accept that at this point. Oh, God, we went 15 minutes because I started talking about Zunes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was very, I'm very passionate about my decision to choose Zune. I, we were, like, one of, like, four people in the entire school who had a Zune. Yeah, and we were, like, the four cool people. Mm, I don't know about that, but I definitely wasn't. Um, this, we were the cool people, but I will say, like, we had a better general life trajectory uh, of people who owned Zunes versus people who owned iPods. I mean, there's about a 75% better trajectory. 25% of the per of the people who own Zunes don't exist anymore. Yeah, that's true. So, like, <laughs> we'll, we'll just temper that. Um... <laughs> So this is this is a podcast um about cryptids, supernatural, um ghosts, which I guess is are supernatural. Me talking about zunes and being religious about pieces of technology. Um all that good stuff. Uh I'm John. I'm Brandon. 96 episodes in and if you finally nailed it. That was the perfect intro. No, it's not. I I can't believe we're at ninety six fucking episodes. We're at ninety six episodes. Uh, so because we're moving towards a hundred episodes, I've been doing some tidying up on my list. Okay. Um, so this week's cryptid, Brandon, was cited in nineteen ninety five. That's fairly taxonomy. recent. Yeah. Um, its taxonomy is depending on who you ask. Canine or reptilian? There's a difference. There's and a difference. The the region. So the region that I'm going to tell you, it's reptilian exclusively in that region. Okay. The region's Puerto Rico. I was expecting this to be a U.S. one. It's um, tech oh, Britain. Puerto wait, Rico wait, is wait, technically no, no, no. the U.S. I'm, I'm I, I, I'm. It's it's a chupi. Yeah, it's it's a chupi. It's a chupi. That's, do you That's, get what the do you get what the hint was now? It's a choopy, no. It's the music that they played in uh for the warthog in uh Red vs. Blue. Oh, the polka music. Oh I get it. Yeah. I get that hint. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um so this week's cryptid is one that I've been putting off for a while. Like yeah. so long that only Marty and and uh Clay were in the the patron notes. That's how long it's been. Um, yeah, this I imagine is a would have been a harder one because it's one of the big, the most popular ones. <laughs> and the most you, would be, you would be wrong. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> so I've long considered it to be one of the heavy hitters of cryptozoology, and while few that can can compete with the infamy that is Bigfoot, uh, in recent Google Trends, Chupacabra is actually a close third. To Mothman, so it goes Bigfoot, Mothman, Chupacabra, but generally in terms of like knowledge of cryptids, it's Bigfoot, Nessie, Chupacabra is what I'd say. 
Um, just in general, like that's fair assessment. That's the kind of uh, back of the envelope thing, which is kind of surprising considering both Bigfoot and Nessie have been around for over a century, and Chupacabra has only really been in vogue. Ninety five. I would have thought yeah. it would have been been uh, older than that. Oh, Brandon. Brandon, Brandon, Brandon. I hope you're ready for this story. Is it's... there a lot of people, like, backdating things? There is, but I completely ignore all of that because I don't find that interesting. Okay. Um, or particularly relevant to the story. It's it's how the, the Chupacabra came into existence that I'm more concerned with. And I think it's hilarious. Okay. Um. So, uh, growing up, I like you, I had assumed that this creature was an older one, when in fact it was one that has come into existence in our lifespan, much like, uh, as much as I hate to admit it, Slender Man, who for some reason people think is real. Um, that, I just don't, people... People that... do, people do. Like, the fact that those girls tried to kill their classmate because of Slender Man indicates that they at least thought, on some level, he is real. It's it's not just Slenderman. I've I've found that they, I've got some like younger nephews and cousins and shit, and um, yeah. the younger younger folk they don't have the word tulpa in their vocabulary. Yeah, but there are things that they are aware of having been created on the internet, but are also still afraid of in the sense that they may be real. Oh, there's well, there's a lot of. There's a lot of Tulpa, like the notion of the Tulpa has, which is a uh, totally fucking like the con- conception of Tulpa that we have today is totally fucking racist. It was come up by like some white uh, lady who went to India. Yeah. So like, that's a whole <laughs> a lot of thing. white people go to India once. <laughs> yeah. And then they, then they come up with a whole religion or some yeah. bullshit that like appropriates all the shit. Um, but so, like, Topa are kind of, like, in vogue in terms of, like, the explanations for supernatural entities lately. Because, um, like, the Rake is another one. Uh, yep. That's that's another one. Um, which I think if you mention the Rake, you get attacked by the Rake. So, like, Rake, 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 Rake. Um, I'll, I'll keep an eye on your webcam. Yeah, uh, I might die. Cartoon Cat it. is one. Cartoon Cat? Yeah. That's new. One. That's a new one to me. It's, uh... It oh, is, that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know what that is now. Um, yeah, so, like... Yeah. Um, despite a relatively short lifespan in the annals of cryptozoology, the Chupacabra has captured the public consciousness. Although, to be honest, cryptozoology itself as a concept is less than 100 years old. Now, this week's primary source, and pretty much my exclusive source is the book Tracking the Chupacabra, The Vampire Beast in Fact, Fiction, and Folklore by Benjamin Radford, which you can take out on uh, archive.org, which is what I did when I read this book. Oh, nice. Um, Shout out archive.org. Yeah, so this is like, basically, this cryptid is an urban legend type cryptid. It's kind of more similar to the Toronto Tunnel monster um, Mm -hmm. in that regard, except... It has completely captured the imaginations of a sizable portion of the world's population. And I have some theories as to that, and I'll get into it later. But, um, yeah. So, with that, let's examine one of the first canonical instances of this cryptid. So, Brandon. Yes. March 1995. Um, Pokemon is still not out. Uh, I think Beast Wars is airing. Let me check. I don't know, Beast Wars was dope. Did you have the Beast Wars video game? I'll take that as a yes. Beast Wars was still a year out. Yes, I did have the Beast Wars video game, Brandon. <laughs> what do you think I am? Some kind of, like, not... Some kind of person who's not obsessed with Beast Wars? True, I you still are. have. I still have the physical copy of that game. Do you? Yeah. That's I cool. PC, I had that for the, P, the PlayStation... Oh, I had it for um, the PC. Yeah. Um what 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 happened in ninety five? What else came out? Well, there is one thing that I know my, came my, out in ninety five. My sister. Oh really? Yeah. 
Uh, I didn't realize she was four years younger. Huh. Wait. Yeah, that's four. Okay, yeah. cool. My math my math skills are not gone. Five minus um, one is four. You're good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Um, so March of 1995, in the small Puerto Rican towns of Orocovis and Morovis, uh, it was a, was particularly auspicious, right? Um, their neighboring municipalities in Puerto Rico, uh, they're located in the center of the small island territory. And for reference, like in case you're not aware, uh, Puerto Rico is an unincorporated U.S. territory in the Caribbean east of Cuba and Hispaniola. Um, residents have U.S. citizenship. However, they are largely disenfranchised at the national level, having no say in the presidential elections. And I don't think that they have a representative in Congress, really. Not like a meaningful one. Yeah. Um, however, they have a population that exceeds 20 U.S. states. <laughs> so, yep. and like in the, in the space of like, it's the, the, like if you were to put it against the states, there's like only two, there's only like one state that's smaller than that. And it's like Rhode Island. So like, yeah. like it's a state that's basic. It's a place that's basically the size of Connecticut and it's completely disenfranchised. So like, you know, cool. Woo. Um, so regardless, the two towns are located in a fairly mountainous region with moderate development. Although the region based on some Google mapping appears to be fairly rural. I've never been there. I've never been to, Puerto Rico in my life and it's a predominantly Spanish speaking country. So like my knowledge, like the, the, I'm relying on secondary sources for this episode because my, I'm not great at Spanish. I can understand basic concepts. And if someone's screaming at me, I can understand why, what I'm doing wrong. Um, and that really is all I need at the very <laughs> least. Um, I, I have, I have, my I have the ability so I have the ability to detect shame in any language when I should be ashamed. <laughs> um I don't necessarily know what people are saying, but I know when I should feel shame based on people's tone. I'm very good I'm very good at picking up on when I should feel shame. There's a a while back I worked with people whose only language was Spanish, which I did, did terribly at in school. And you'd be surprised at um, the level that you can communicate through just, like, having a general awareness of your surroundings and gestures. You can communicate, yeah. like, th to some extent, like, fairly specific concepts. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, I mean, I'm not surprised. We're, as humans, we're pretty well adapted to that. Um, communication is our strong suit. It's just, language is more for abstract concepts than it is for anything else. Um, yeah. When you're in a physical location, it's it's easier to communicate intent um, and desire. But like, if you're trying to communicate a like a political system or like something along my, those lines, it's way harder. Um, yeah, or beliefs I, and things. I had like a those dream things. yesterday that I had. Well, I guess that'd be t before I woke up today. Whenever what the, during my last yeah. sleep. I had to explain to the uh, the Queen of England what prog rock was, but she had never heard of, listened to rock in general before. So I was having a hard time struggling the, uh, to communicate those concepts. Because, like, how do you communicate what a sound is or the theme of a sound? <laughs> so here's the real secret, though, Brandon. Yeah? She was a secret member of... Uh... The Queen is Secret Isis? She was a secret Pink Floyd member. Oh. Say. oh, we went two different directions, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Yeah. We really did. We went like so different. Like so <laughs> so wildly different. <laughs> like I we're completely on different wavelengths today, I guess. Oh, possibly. Um So anyways, getting back to the story. That March, residents reported that animals had apparently been drained of blood through small puncture wounds on their necks. Goats were the primary uh, targets of these mysterious exsanguinations performed by some unseen vampiric creature. Now, with a comedic flair, the elusive uh, creature, perpetrating creature, was dubbed the Chupacabra. Now, Brandon, that literally means what? Do you know? There's, I heard, 
it means goat sucker, but I don't yeah. know Spanish well enough to know if that's true or not. So I just Googled goat Cabra's, in Spanish. Cabra is goat, Cabra's and Chupa goat. is the onomatopoeia for suck, I think. True. Okay. I think. I'll believe uh, it, because they've... They have different um, automata, uh, like animals make oh, different sounds in different suck. languages. It oh, literally it means, means suck? suck. It literally uh, means suck. So it's it's literally suck goat. So goat sucker. Yeah. Um, Which takes me back to that Family Guy clip about the cow getting milked. <laughs> <laughs> so an interesting fact about the chupacabra, though, is uh, the original coiner of the term is unknown. Well. We have two potential people who could have it could have been. Um, gotcha. Silverio Perez and Ismael Agayo lay claim to the honor. Um, with Silverio Perez being the one who like claimed it was him first, and then another guy, um, his friend was basically like, "Nah, nah, nah. This was this was uh, Ismael." Um, so okay, so they were in the same social circle. N- no, not maybe. I don't know. Okay. There's a lot of people in Puerto Rico, so like I don't know if that I can I'm comfortable making that assumption. Um, but it should be noted uh, that historically speaking, the term chupacabra is not a new one. It was used to describe whippoorwill b- birds on the Western show Bonanza. And uh, Brandon, will you click on the, the little link there? What's a, what's a a wi- a wi- 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 whippoorwill? Yeah, a whippoorwill is like a type of bird. Oh, I saw um, this. Yeah. Uh it's um it's like a like a it kind of looks like a a sparrow but like it's got a longer hook on the beak and like it's a small tiny little gray bird. Um yeah. Uh so in the bonanza context, uh it had been referring to the folklore that whippoorwills would drink goat's milk. So, while the moniker is the same, the noun which de- it defined um, was strictly different. So, in the case of the whippoorwill, goat sucker defined as it was it was focusing on the the milk, whereas in the case of the chupacabra, this vampire creature, it's focusing on blood. Blood now, is thicker than milk. Oh wait, is that true? I was just saying that as a joke, but now now my brain just went to is that a true statement? I don't know. I don't think so. It depends on the type of milk, right? Because if it has a higher fat content, probably not. Yeah, um, so let's see. You know, so, Brandon, we've mentioned this. You've talked. We've talked about this before in the past. Not on the podcast, but we've talked about airbrushing. Yes. You know what my least favorite statement is about airbrushing? Oh, blood is, in fact, thicker than milk. I just looked it up. What's up? Okay. Do you know what my, do you know what my least favorite thing about airbrushing is? cleaning the gun when you're done that sucks but the other thing is when people describe the like the level of mixture that you're supposed to have they always oh, say it's yeah. the consistency of milk yeah brandon what kind of milk is it is it two percent one percent two percent one skim, percent full fat half whole? and half i drink oat milk yeah what is it is it almond milk it could be almond milk no one fucking says yeah. <laughs> Do you know how mad that makes me? Is... I need specificity. Yeah. So I think like I I'm pretty sure I've been I'm pretty sure I've been using uh uh that completely wrong my entire like the entire time I've ever probably like, airbrushed cuz when I think of milk my brain goes to 2%. That's what I do too, but like I don't know. I always go either too watery or too thick. It's it always... I always fuck it up. That's why you need test sprays. It's true. Um, but as we've seen in past context, the act of naming a cryptid is frequently the point it becomes, like, real to the populace. Uh, Mokila Membe, Nessie, and even Sasquatch are in part by defined by the acquisition of their moniker. And we'll go over Nessie and Sasquatch, but, like, we talked about Mokila Membe and, like, how after it got its name, it kind of exploded in terms of, like, people looking into it. Um, and really, Chupacabra is no different. As as Benjamin Radford puts it, the one-word label gave it a name, currency, cr- and credibility. And soon, dozens of eyewitnesses would give it dozens of chaotic forms. It would be a whopping five months before the Chupacabra was first sighted in Canavanas, a town 20 minutes east of the capital city of Puerto Rico, San Juan. So, um, 
That's a pretty long time. But like, here's the yeah. thing: during those five months, people were absolutely accusing the chupacabra of killing their animals. So like, there's no description of it. But for five months, people are like scapegoating <laughs> the uh, These... the chupacabra. Yeah. Now, Brandon, before you scroll down, okay, if you haven't scrolled if you haven't scrolled down already. Can you describe to me what what do you think of when you think of the chupacabra? First thing that pops in your head. So there, there, there's, there's two of them because there's the, the dog with mange version. Yep. And then there's the, um, the alien version where it's got like, um, the ha- eyes like how people in the fifties would have thought aliens' eyes looked, and then it's yep. got um, like a mohawk of spikes, kind of like the needler from Halo, but in like one. Yeah. One line. No, that's 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 actually a pretty. Uh, that's those are the two like most popular variations of yeah. it. Yeah, I'd say, and, and not so much like reptile. It doesn't come to head necessarily. It's more like alien monster versus weird dog thing. I always get like a reptilian feel off of the the spiked one. If I'm yeah. gonna be completely honest, because like it kind of reminds me of like a spiked dinosaur mixed with a gray alien. Yeah, kind of. It's like a little fusion dance right there. <laughs> um, so, in September of uh, 1995, Madeline Tolentino, a housewife from Canavanas, was the first to spot the creature. The creature, she said, had large, dark eyes, similar to gray aliens, that curved around the sides. So, like, it kind of, like, went up to the temples. Um, huh. It walked bipedally and was about four feet in height. So, like, usually the general range is anywhere from three feet to six feet, which is a very wide range. I've never heard of the six foot choopies. Oh boy. Yeah. Um, so the arms and legs were skinny and they terminated in three fingered hands and three fingered toes. Well, three toed feet. I three fingered toes, (laughs) three fingered toes. They've got, well, basically they kind of look like three fingers. So like, whatever. Um, so continuing the similarities to the grays that, uh, the creature had no nose and instead had a pair of nose holes over a thin, lipless mouth. Although, depending on who draws it, it's different. Like, sometimes there's teeth. Sometimes there's, like, a grimace or whatever. But whatever. Yeah. Um, additionally, spikes ran down the chupacabra's back starting on the head, as you described in the, the more reptilian form. Um, and at this point in the story, you might be confused. Why is the cryptid being described as a reptilian little goblin? Right? Photos of the chupacabra are usually more of a mangy coyote than anything else, right? Yeah. Or they look kind of like a, a wolverine or something along those lines. They're very much more like... They're like, more dog-like. The Yeah, like the, the descriptions and the photos are like extremely different, right? Which, which is kind of weird for um, yeah. a, a cryptid. So, so that's a very good question, Brandon. That I asked rhetorically, because I'm full of myself. Um, <laughs> but we're not there in the Chupacabra's timeline yet, so we'll come back to that. We'll come back, like you know, just, just we'll we'll get back to that. Um, but let's keep talking about the reptilian version of this vampire. So the creature mainly stayed in Puerto Rico until early 1996. Um, given the landlocked nature of Puerto Rico, this is unsurprising because you wouldn't expect. Like, you're not expecting a chupacabra to hop on a log and, like, go to Miami. Right? Yeah. Um, however, daytime talk shows know no such boundaries. In March of 1996, um, and what can I say? The, the chupacabra is just a winter cryptid. It likes the cold. Uh, it must. Uh, Christina Sarah Legui, Sarah I don't know if I pronounced that last name right. Uh, Cover the Chupacabra on her show, El Show de Cristina. And now, while I can't find the... <laughs> the Cristina the show. Segment, the Cristina show. Yeah, yeah, it's literally the Cristina show. Um, and while I can't find the segment in question, and, like, I literally can barely read and understand basic stra- Spanish, so, like, give me a break, um, <laughs> the show aired on Univision, which is a network which supplies content to many speaking countries in the Americas and the United States. So, like, uh, Chile... Um, Mexico, United States, Puerto Rico, you know, just all over the fucking place. Um, and 
um, after report the report aired, reports of the chupacabra began to crop up in Mexico in the Spanish speaking sections of the United States. So like in South America, et cetera, et cetera. Like it even there's even a report from Brazil, which is not Spanish speaking, but we'll get into that in a second. Cause the Brazil's Portuguese. Um, but it's a part of like the, the chupacabra like oeuvre. So we'll cover that. The chupaverse. The Chupaverse. So at this point, the Chupacabra transcended being just a simple regional cryptid in Puerto Rico to becoming a scourge to livestock in the Western Hemisphere. Now, after its apparent exodus from Puerto Rico, the Chupacabra began to make appearances in Spanish-speaking countries in the Americas, as I mentioned before. As was the case in Puerto Rico, these stories were largely the same. Dead animals found apparently drained of blood. Two puncture marks are found with the neck or somewhere else. Uh, the explosion in, crypt- in Chupacabra sightings largely follows this pattern with the lion's share of discoveries uh, of its supposed influence. Like, So, like, let me re-say that, because I read that wrong. <laughs> Basically, people find the bodies. They don't see the cryptid. Yeah. They find the bodies, and they're like, this is the Chupacabra. Yeah. Um. So now, like... The phenomena was even investigated by the Guadalajara Zoo in May of 1996. And this is a quote from the Associated Press, and you got something to say, so say it. No, I applaud you getting through Guadalajara. Oh, uh, I. So, Guadalajara is something I've had to say a lot because a lot of, like, manufacturing at IBM went through Guadalajara. So, like, I was familiar with how to pronounce it. Oh, okay. I was yeah. like, man, he tackled that one really good just for, like, a casual line read. That was I good. know I know Guadalajara. Like I I know Guadalajara. That's that's a place that like I've talked to people from and like I've com- had to communicate with like engineers and like assembly workers there. Yeah. So like that's an easy one for me. Okay. Nice. Mm-hmm. So this is from the Associated Rep- Press report about the Guadalajara Zoo investigation. The dead animals all reportedly have tooth marks about a third of an inch across in the neck and appear to have been drained of blood. Rumors of the attacks on livestock are roaring through Jalisco despite official doubt and denial heaped upon them. Francisco Rodriguez Heron, director of the Guadalajara Zoo, took a cast of a paw print and said it looked like that of a large dog or wolf. So I always pictured the puncture marks being farther apart than that for them to be a third of an inch that's like a nosferatu kind of bite there it's also kind of a vampire bite vampire bat bite too yeah to be fair like that um, they're, they're real close yeah so they're they're pretty well also i'm not sure if it's a third of an inch across in terms of like the spacing or if that's like the size of the puncture that's another important thing um Oh yeah, is that their yeah, diameter? I, I, is that, that was their the way center to center. That was spacing? the way I read it the first time, but like it could be either. And yeah, like, whatever. Um, but soon after, Cryptopedia favorite Joe Nickel produced a report for Skeptical Inquirer magazine that noted the wild dogs were literally always the cause of the goat sucker reports in Mexico. Like literally, every yeah. case was could be attributed to wild dogs. Scientific investigators and police alike found that the reports were simply predation by wild dogs in Mexico. Like, they would stake out the farms that the chupacabra struck, and yeah. without fail, a, a wild dog would show up. Like, okay, <laughs> there is literally no cases that I could find in which it was anything other than, like, a wild dog when someone went to investigate it. Yeah, no one observed a small lizard alien gray thing. No, no. Yeah. Now, the Chupacabra was then reported to have struck Kalama in Chile, April 2000. Unverified reports allege that as many as 300, and I read one place someone said 800, but I'm going with a 300 number because that seems more reasonable, um, had been found dead, some of which had been drained of blood. Some of which. Keep that in mind. Not all of. Some of. Um, it should be noted that the wilderness in the region hosted pumas and other small predators. And I'm pretty sure it's like a desert region, like around Kalama, based on what I've seen. And like the Animal X video that I skimmed through because it's really hard to watch those videos. Um, <laughs> so 
really like just general attacks on livestock, not real news. It's more of the fact that there were like a lot of them. Yeah. That was and the problem. Do they know that they have been drained of blood and it wasn't just the blood pooling because gravity? Huh? What are you talking about? <laughs> well, gravity, like, th- like what, what are you fluids, talking about? fluids may tend to settle. But what are you talking and, about? And then, like, if the fluid does settle and there what, are... What? Then it could appear that the, the, there isn't blood, but really, you gotta, like, it's on the bottom. Brandon, we have, like, three sections before we get to debunking this. Okay. <laughs> we have, like, three full sections. You gotta, you gotta give me time to get okay. there. Okay. <laughs> Ah, um, so the event became a media sensation, leading to investigation called for by the local governor, uh, Francisco Segorka, Segokia, Segosia, 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 that's it, um, which took castings of footprints and revealed once again, the perpetrators of the attacks had likely been feral dogs. You're beginning to see a pattern. You're not alone, but... UFOlogists started to get mixed up in the timeline and muddy the water a little bit, as they tend to do. Please tell me we're going to have some MUFON action. No MUFON. No! Uh, that I found. There's probably MUFON stuff, but, like, I'm largely following the the uh, stuff that um, Benjamin Radford investigated, because, like, <sighs> reading through Chupacabra reports is boring. Because they're all the same. Like. Yeah. Literally. All of them <laughs> are the same, Brandon. It's so fucking boring. Like, there's nothing interesting. Like, the reason it took me so long to do this is because, like, I read a bunch of stuff. Like, random stuff before I read yeah. the book. And it was just like. This is going to be a short episode because it's literally just the chupacabra shows up. It kills a thing. Then it drains it of blood. It's usually not seen. When it's seen, it sometimes looks like a reptile. Other times it looks like a dog, depending on where you are and when it was. There are pictures <laughs> of it. And there are they find dead ones sometimes. The end. So, like... I, I'm glad, I'm very grateful that Benjamin Radford actually, like, did the research on this, because, like... Yeah, that sounds excruciating. This is, like, like, I am so... I thought I was interested in the Chupacabra, and then, like, when I started to research the Chupacabra, I'm like, this is so boring. It's, yeah. Except for the alien stuff, because the alien stuff's pretty great. That's, We're about to get into that's that. That's what I imagine what, what it'll look like. My favorite part about the Chupacabra is the episodes on TV... Where they'll have, um, like, some lady will be like, I found a chupacabra corpse, um, so I cut off its head, and I've been keeping the body and head in my freezer for the last uh, six months, but no research center would uh, take a look at it. And then, like, Monster Qu- whoever on History Channel, um, is like, th- they have the money to, like, pay some scientists to do it because before he's like, no, that's clearly a dog. And, and they ended up just telling a lady that she's had a dead dog in her freezer next to like <laughs> her fucking egos for the last six months. Oh, geez. What episode did we talk about the, the dead tiger on the dead tiger? I, we definitely talked about it. It <sighs> was in like the Texacarna region, right? Yeah. It was like a, it's like a skunk ape or something. I don't know. People like to put, dead animals into freezers thinking that they're cryptids. It's just a thing. Yeah. It's a trend. It's really just a trend. Um, So anyways, in fact, ufologists were on the Chupacabra almost as soon as it left Puerto Rico. Virgilio Sanchez Ojejo Osejo o, I thought I had this o, Sejo Osejo I think the, is the J and H? Osejo. Sanchez Osejo. There, that's it. That seems right. Um, it's it's Sanchez and then O-C-E-J-O. I'm not sure how you pronounce that. And there's that so. nasty hyphen in there. No, the, the hyphen means nothing. The hyphen's fine. What it's did the, the hyphen ever do to you? The hyphen is not meaningless. It's like a pause. You, like you must basic, apologize. 
Uh, you don't even necessarily read the hyphen. Like, whatever. Um, of the Miami UFO Center allegedly took a pa- plaster ca- cast of a footprint of the Chupacabra in Miami, Florida, March 11th, 1996. Which is, like, really, like, basically the day after El Show de Cristina, effectively. Because, like, that happened in March. So, like, it was pretty quick. Now, Sanchez Ojejo, Osejo was convinced that the Chupacabra was not only the originator of this, but that it was extraterrestrial in nature for some reason. Now, oh, there we the, go. The yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I, I couldn't tell. I was like, what the heck am I? Lo-? I see it now. Um, so Sanchez Ojejo... Oh, the ufologist even <laughs> believed that his print matched the print from the 2000 Kalama Chile case. To him, this affirmed the credibility of his cast and tied into Chilean rumors that the beast was extraterrestrial, which we'll get into in a second. Um, Once again, I must note that the Chilean cast was determined to belong to a wild dog. Yeah, it looks very much like a dog footsie. Yeah, so unless it was wildly successful cover-up, which some members members of the uh, public did in fact believe in Chile at the time, this argument only serves to weaken his position. The print is, in fact, such weak evidence that Jonathan Downs, a credulous cryptozoologist, as far as I can tell, um, who investigated the Chupacabra, decried in print the print as not being able to stand up in a court of law. Oh, good. <laughs> Furthermore, Esteban Sarimento, Sarmiento a primatologist and functional anatomist at the uh, American Museum of Natural History found evidence that the source print had either been sculpted or the animal's paw had been pushed into the ground. While the ufologist may not have been the source of the hoax footprint, he certainly appeared to be propping one up. It really looks like it's way too clean of a cast for it to be like... The dog would have had to be... like It would have had to have like two of me sitting on its back for the foot to like go that deep into the ground or the ground would have had yeah. to have been extremely soft but I imagine if the ground was that soft it you wouldn't have that kind of um it would it would lose definition because the the ground would get yeah, all fucked it get, get all fucky yeah, it's, to get technical it's way it's way too clean so now as noted before Santos Osejo uh, is not the only person to propagate the chupa, alien chupacabra theory in fact it's a fairly popular one now, returning to Chile, Chilean rea- UFO researchers had their share of stories about the creature, which were carried in the newspaper in the region following the official explanation of the Kalama affair. While I can't find the original articles, um, unexplainedstuff.com has the following say to say about the local spuddle- scuttlebutt. UFO enthusiasts theorized that aliens brought the monsters to test the planet's atmosphere in order to prepare a massive invasion for Earth. A widely popular story spread throughout Chile um, that Chilean soldiers had captured a chupacabra male, female, and cub that had been living in a north mine of Kalama. Then, according to the account, a team of NASA scientists arrived in black helicopters and reclaimed the chupacabra family. The creatures, so the story claimed, had escaped from a secret NASA facility in the Atacama Desert north of northern Chile, where the U.S. Space Agency was attempting to create some kind of hybrid beings that could survive on Mars. Now, Brandon, why the fuck would the why the fuck would NASA be in Chile? Why wouldn't they just be in like like our deserts in like fucking Utah? Yeah, they or would... New Mexico. <laughs> yeah, they, 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 and why would they be doing like SCP shit? And why wouldn't they just be in right next to uh, the uh, uh, JLP, the J, uh, JPL? Like it, I don't get it. <laughs> also, NASA's Na- there is actually some biological you know what? Research. It would make more sense to be JPL, the Jet Propulsion yes. Laboratories, than it would NASA for very, very specific reasons. <laughs> yes, it would make so much more sense. Yeah, but like, this is like peak. This is peak conspiracy thought where you throw out a bunch of like acronym soup and like, you know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um. And now, while the U.S. government has done some extremely shitty stuff to South and Central America, like, extremely shitty stuff, I doubt this particular story somehow. Yeah. Now, oh, uh, just, um, sorry, extra- just, just in case someone what didn't know the dots to connect about JPL, 
and weird shit is they have a tie to both Aleister Crowley and Scientology through their uh, the guy that started it. Mm, he, like, hung out with them. <laughs> I mean, who didn't hang out with Aleister Crowley and, like, Ella He's Hubbard? He's problematic, but probably could seem like he would he would have been fun to party with. Or actually, no, not. Yeah, I, I mean, take that. I redact that. No, I just remembered something that, no, I take that back. No, I wouldn't want to party with Aleister Crowley. I'm not going to lie. He just seems insufferable. And so is so is uh, L. Ron Hubbard. They're both insufferable. They're both insufferable. Aleister Crowley did a lot of hallucinogens in the desert performing rituals in order to have sex with people while they were tripping balls. Yeah, he had a lot of he had a he was a power bottom, that's for sure. No, he he would without asking make you the power bottom. No, he was while a power I'm pretty sure he was demons. a power bottom. I'm pretty sure oh, Alistair Crowley was a power bottom. Like I'm like that's like a thing, I think. One second. Now well, I need to look this up. <laughs> I thought, I thought, let's see, let's do Crowley. The uh, the name of, so the, the pod, the last podcast in the last episode, uh, describes him as the world champion power bottom, Alistair Crowley. Okay. I, I'm sure they've, they've, uh, looked more into it. I thought he did something in the desert with, uh, Jack Parsons, but I could be wrong. Oh, he did, but that's a whole nother thing. Okay. He did a lot of things. He yeah. did a lot of. He, he got a lot. He got things. around to a lot of shit. That guy. <laughs> yes, yes, he did. Yep. Now, um, I continuing off the whole like extraterrestrial thing. Uh, they were also integrated into the narrative in a Brazilian creature known as O Bicho, which is literally the beast. Um, I want to point out <gasps> also again. Also, Alistair Crowley's nickname. We're tying it all together. It's perfect. God damn it. I want to point out again that Brazil is a Portuguese speaking country. It's not Spanish speaking. Um, that's going to be important in a second. So Joseph Trainer, an editor of UFO Roundup, reported one story taking place February 1997 in which Jose Batista de Moraes, Moraes uh, had a supposed encounter with Obicho. Um, when I approached the corral, I heard a sheep bleeding and a loud rumble, a type of growling I'd never heard before, uh, Batista said. I tried to enter through the gates, but they were tightly shut. By the time I got to the other gate, the strange animal had escaped. Inside the corral, Batista switched on the lights and found a scene of massacre. Twelve sheep lay dead, and another eleven were very much chewed up. All the sheep were mutilated with surgical precision. Is uh, I'll hold off my comments till later in the episode. Okay. okay. Yeah, I, I figured. I figured that would. I figured that would get you. Yeah, because it got me. Um, so superficially, the story matched the tried and true stories of the chupacabra. However, the lack of exsanguination is notable, as Benjamin Radford notes in tracking the chupacabra. The connection is to the chupacabra is one that is in fact fabricated by Jovis Tra Trainer. Um, the more interesting feature of this story, however, is how it more or less pa parallels cattle mutilation stories in the UFO world, um, which I want, if you w want more on that, I think we talk about in detail in the Skimwalker Ranch episode, which is episode 21, which is 75 episodes ago. Yeah, that um, sound, that's actually, technically it's crazy far away. I would yeah, have thought that would have been, oh, gross. Yeah, gross. Um, in both cases, the death of the livestock is frequently mysterious. The blood has been drained from the body with no pools nearby, and surgical incisions are frequently described. Um, really, to my knowledge, there are only two key differences between alien mutilation, cattle mutilation, and the chupacabra, in that the chupacabra is renowned for targeting of goats, and the chupacabra is typically the, spa the scapegoat in predominantly Spanish-speaking communities in the Americas. There's, I'd like to point out how proud John is of using scapegoat <laughs> in that sentence. I was very happy about that, too. <laughs> um, but yeah, Brandon, you, you were correct to highlight the fact that they were talking about mutilated with surgical precision and then also saying that it was a massacre and they were very much chewed up. 
Yeah, there, there's a lot of uh, counter language that doesn't necessarily agree with itself. So I talked. I like I didn't talk about this in the podcast because like I didn't want to like write all this down. Is the real problem? Um, but like people frequently are like, I I I can't even imagine a, a like a tool could do that type kind of stuff when they're referring to like chupacabra sightings. Like it's too precise. An animal couldn't do this. Tools could do. Tools have been doing shit like that all the time Obs- for a very long time. For an obsidian yeah, long time. Like obsidian <laughs> is a thing, right? Yeah. Like obsidian like I, and embalming are not new. <laughs> doesn't obsidian like cut molecules? Even I feel like it's still used because it, it, it's it's a uh, structure. Like animal- like, it, it cuts on, like, a molecular level, doesn't it? Or something crazy like that? Something crazy. I don't know if it cuts molecules, but it could it separates them. It, it, yeah. Like, the, it's things... Oh, also talking about... So, I've been watching a lot of, like, um... Uh, they can... Okay, wait. Before you go to that, Obsidian can, in fact, cut cells in DNA. Yeah. Yeah. So, like... The tools are, have yeah. been around. I, I've been watching a lot of morticians answering questions on YouTube. Mm-hmm. I don't know why, but I like it. Gives me less anxiety about death for some reason. I just... The the way that I dealt with my anxiety for death was I just got... I cried so much about it that it just no longer feel... I no longer feel anything about it. Oh, I just start thinking about it, and then I panic, and then I watch morticians describe what they do to your corpse. And I was like, this helps for some reason. I've, I've like, it's weird because, like, as a kid, death was a very scary thing to me. And, like, now as an adult, I've, like, more or less been, like, meh. Whatever. <laughs> You're like, meh, well, as long as I get that Power Ranger on, on pre order. I mean, that's kind of how it works for me right now. Like, I got that fucking Ninja on lock, dude. <laughs> I feel like you just have a card in your wallet that says, bury me with my stuff. <laughs> I do have a standing request to have my my transmetal cheetor uh, buried with me. We can that make that sta- happen. That is a standing request. Although I also want to be, uh, I also want to be um, cremated or like thrown in a ditch. So like I don't know. I want to be buried vertically. Because why not? Who does it? That's new. Just put me in a ditch. Give me a sky burial. There's feed me la- the cheetahs. Launch me, launch my body at Jeff Bezos. Bezos. Like I want to be duct taped to a rocket because by then he'll be a cyborg or some shit. So next mm-hmm. time he takes his dick rocket into space, launch my corpse <laughs> at him to intercept it. I want that to be my legacy. That's fair. I mean, that what what more can we all live like a, aspire to? To be totally honest, if Sc- if the guy that played Scotty can be launched into space, I want my corpse to take out a billionaire. <laughs> I mean, that's fair. That's a lofty aspiration, Brandon. It is. Um. So so far, we've been mainly dealing with the reptilian gray like form of the chupacabra. That being said, as far as I can tell, this description. Literally only happened once, and that was the initial sighting. I can't, like, find very good evidence to support that this is, like, something that people saw. So, like, yeah. other than that initial time. Um, Chupacabra, however, has an incredibly varied range of appearances. In fact, with the exception of the first sighting and the more dog-like sightings, which we'll cover in more detail in a minute, there are few, if any, similarities between the multitude of sightings of the creature. Now, for example, um, returning to America, a young boy in suburban Tucson claimed that a Chupacabra had invaded his home around 1997. Now, this is the description that was given. A chupacabra opened the front door to their home, slammed a door behind it, and walked through the kitchen, and sat on the boy's bed before jumping out a window. He described it as three feet tall, with long arms and no legs, a beak and a bright nose. So the beak and nose are very unique. That boy done just met his sleep paralysis demon, so uh, congratulations. (laughs) You get a party. So, um... A wildly different account, which makes me think it was more likely that the boy had seen 
uh, the torso Cenobite three years before the film had been released because it literally <laughs> sounds like he described that description is the torso Cenobite from Hellraiser Inferno, but it released in 2000. So it can't be like him seeing that Cenobite, but like it's got it's got major Cenobite energy to it. We need to petition Netflix to keep the Hellraiser, all of the Hellraisers on Netflix year round, not just some of them in October. Why is that? Oh, because I would watch every Hellraiser once a year if it was available on any of my streaming platforms, but it, it's not. And even there was like two years Netflix had all of them and I just like one every day would watch one. N not even last year. They didn't even have them last year. They had like one, I think Hellraiser 1 and 2. They didn't have all, e even the weird ones they didn't have. I'm like, y y give, me my, give me my Hellraiser. It's my favorite horror movie. Why don't you own your favorite horror movie then? That has crossed my mind that I should, but I don't have a DVD. Well, I have a PlayStation. I, I could um, get them. You could get six. Hell, wait, how many Hellraiser movies are there? One. There's a lot. Uh, you can get six of them right now on Vudu for twenty five dollars, Brandon. Uh, you can get. Weirdly, you, you it doesn't include Hellraiser, the original Hellraiser. There, there are, by the way, 10 Hellraiser movies. It has Hellraiser 3, Hellraiser 4, Hellraiser 5, Hellraiser 6, Hellraiser 7, and Hellraiser 8. It doesn't have one or two. Oh, there's a, a, a reason for that. I think one and two are the only Hellraisers that Clive Barker was involved with, the guy that created oh. Hellraiser, and all the rest of them were made without him. And I heard that they were making Hellraiser 12 with Clive Barker, but I think that's just kind of stuck in production hell. You can get, like, you can get a considerable number of the Hellraiser movies for 30 bucks. I want all the Hellraisers and all the Tremors. Fair. That one, the Tremors is actually, like, locked to Netflix, though. Because they, yes. they funded it. Um, so... Anywho, returning to the chupacabra. Uh, in Chile, one person reported a chupacabra as a strange winged beast about the size of the man running alongside his car as he drove home. The chupacabra moniker appears to have been applied to by the police in this case. And then another sighting in Chile describes the creature as a winged kangaroo resembling the Jersey Devil, which apparently had been captured by a miner in 2001 Reportedly, the creature then escaped and was cornered in a nearby mine, but the story ends after it gets cornered. Um, there are a plethora of other descriptions of the creature, adding supernatural jumping, varying degrees of hairiness, and in some cases, even telepathy. I know of at least two cases that included telepathy. I like telepathic chupacabra. Um, there was one story about a person who got attacked by a chupacabra that I didn't cover because, like, I tried to watch the story and it was boring. Yeah. So, like, I didn't want to, like, I would have loved to talk about it, but it it it, it committed the cardinal sin of just being too boring for me to, like, pay attention to it. I I imagine the telepathic chupacabra, it, it, it looks like that creature, but the way it drains you is similar to, like, Colin Robinson from what we do in the shadows. <laughs> a psychic, it's a psychic chupacabra. Yeah. I mean, that kind of gets into the whole, like... So, the Chupacabra is very much an extension of the vampire myth. Like, like, literally. It is literally just a reskin of the vampire myth. So, like, yeah. you're not far off. Um, so, the prevailing descriptor of the Chupacabra has moved from a bipedal creature of indeterminate shape and begun to move to be more dog-like in nature. Now, it appears this shift occurred sometime in the aughts, um, because this is the variation I'm personally most familiar with. Like, when I think of Chupacabra, the first thing I think of is the Meiji Coyote. Yes. Um, like, literally, that's like, you say Chupacabra, that pops into my head instantly. Um, now, likewise, it's the only iteration that has, in quotes, photographic evidence. That being said... <laughs> Most of the photographs are of desiccated mangy coyote corpses, which even a casual observer should be able to identify. 
A particularly noteworthy example of this is in the 2004 Elmendorf Beasts case, where a farmer killed the supposed chupacabra in Elmendorf, Texas. The creature was 20 pounds, had a severe overbite, bluish skin, and was hairless. Uh, the creature was found ultimately to be either a Mexican hairless dog or a coyote with mange after analysis. The body was in really rough shape, so, like, it was kind of hard to ID-, ID it, and, like, DNA had been damaged by sunlight and stuff like that, so it's, like, it was kind of a nightmare to, like, try mm. and figure out what it was. Um, incidentally, taxidermy chupacabra is, like, a thing. Why? Like... In Benjamin Radford's book, there are so many pictures of people who had taxidermy chupacabras, and it's just basically all taxidermy like mangy wool, like coyotes. Why like, would you want almost that, though? all of it? I don't know. I don't know. And I have a picture of uh, like a desiccated coyote. Yeah. Taxidermy is also expensive, by the way. Yep, check it's- testa. It's rather expensive because I've looked into taxidermy squirrels. Expensive. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Yeah. It's a whole process. Um, there's also video co- footage of the chupacabra matching the description running down the road. And you don't need to click that link because it's just a coyote running down the road. Um, as well as a still <laughs> film from a security camera showing a canine killing a group of chickens as you can see there in the picture. And it's definitely yeah. not a mangy coyote, but instead a uh, it's a hundred percent chupacabra, like. Um, although I guess you could make the argument that some people are saying that like it's a undiscovered or undefined species of canine, but like, or it could just be a color morph. The thing I think, see, the problem with chupacabra is that the po- photographs they have of it are actually clear and thus disprove its existence. Yeah, it's pretty clear that it's not. Well, well, the the dog chupacabra once again there's no pictures or like correct anything yes. outside of that initial like description yeah. for the reptile chupacabra in my all opinion. of the video and photo evidence of the dog version of the chupacabra exceptionally clear which make it very it's very it, it's pretty obvious yeah. that it's like it's a wild dog or a coyote yeah. of some kind like, like like it's really fucking obvious the most out of focus thing in this image that you're showing of the chupacabra is the chicken being ragdolled in its mouth the do- the chicken that is in the process of being killed. Yeah. Um. So like, to me, this iteration of the chupacabra is like adopted in response to the official and frankly likely story taken from various municipalities identifying the killer as wild dog. So like, um, to me, it's more or less a mimetic u- mutation of the story in which adherents assign a supernatural quality to the attacks uh, to explain the lack of blood and apparent lack of consumption of the animal corpses. A chupacabra, for some reason, is either more palatable or, at the very least, more exciting than a rogue wild dog. Moreover, assigning the blame to chupacabras over a wild dog generally represents a fundamental lack of understanding of wild dogs' habits. Um, A frequent codifier in the description of, like, why it needs to be a chupacabra is because it left the corpses without eating them. Now, however, this behavior has been noticed in wild dogs in the past particularly in Queensland, Australia, in which um, I have a quote from a Robert Belcher, a livestock producer, who said the following about wild dogs. A lot of people don't realize that when you're sound asleep, if there's one or two dogs in your paddock, they can do an enormous amount of damage in a very short period of time. They're not in it to eat. They're in to kill. They enjoy killing. This is what sets them apart from so many other predators. They're not hunting to eat. They're hunting to kill for fun. But what drained the blood you made to cry? And for this, I point to cattle mutilations. While this is a gross simplification of cattle mutilations, the general theory is that blood is consumed by bugs, destroyed by the sun, or absorbed in the ground as it pools to the bottom of the body. To me, Occam's razor reigns supreme in this case because the idea of one creature needing to consume so much blood is patently absurd. So just to go back to um, Robert Belcher... And uh, his yeah. comments on the paddocks. I know a few people who are chicken coop owners. And if you yeah. are a chicken coop owner, you can confirm the coyotes will just come and just, like, kill shit and leave and not eat it. Like, they mm-hmm. they, they just, they like killing things. 
if fishers, you have a cat, fishers will do that too. If you have a cat, you may notice that they'll just leave you dead mice. They don't kill for yeah. food. Although cats kill, cats leave you dead mice because they think you're just a fucking awful, awful hunter. And yeah. like you're starving yourself to death and they're like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. They, 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 they leave you pity mice because they think you suck at getting your own food. To that point, mm-hmm. I go, well, fuck you, cat. Who's been feeding you for the last six years? What do you think? They, 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 uh, yeah, I go out and hunt, but it, it, I'm just hunting tin cans. <laughs> Sometimes I have to hunt down Dakota's food, so that's a that's a thing. Um, but yeah, so like cattle mutilation is it's really just the same thing as cattle mutilation, as you mentioned before, like blood pooling, insects eating the blood, sun drying out the blood, you know absorption of the ground because like we're also talking about like deserts so like they're not exactly humid and like the soil's not exactly rich with uh uh like moisture so like it's going to go in and then like you know there's so many freaking insects but um anywho at the core the chupacabra is a modern retelling of the vampire story and this is explored in great depth by benjamin radford in the episode's primary source uh And, like, the evidence of the chupacabra in folklore is really just the vampire myth folded into a three-foot reptile dog or kangaroo package. Like, as far as I can tell, like, everything that uh, people are like, oh, the chupacabra existed before, and, like, it's more or less just the vampire monomyth. Yeah. Or, like, like, in the same way that, like, you'll have werewolves everywhere and, like, stuff like that. It's... It's a specific, like, type of fear that we have that is kind of endemic to human nature. Um, And, like, we naturally bring it up because (sighs) these are things that scare us, right? Like, there's something that scares humanity at its base nature about, like, a vampire conceptually. And, like, that's fair. Um, But, yeah. So... However, I'm not talking about... I haven't talked about the original Chupacabra yet, have I? So, what caused the original Chupacabra? The like, alien description Chupi wow. Chup? Yeah, what happened in what happened in Puerto Rico in 1995 that caused, like, the Chupacabra to come into existence? And in a word, Brandon? Rats. How do you... How... how... But from how do we get from rats, which I would describe as very m- mammal looking, to a three to six foot tall alien looking S- lizard? So, um, Jonathan ha- Dow has presented a hypothesis, hypothesis that there was an explosion in the local rat population of Puerto Rico, which he has anecdotal evidence of, which, you know, whatever, um, that led to an increase in the mongoose population. As the rat, po- rat population d- dwindled, the mongoose had less to feed, and as a result, they started predating the local livestock. Once the mopu- mongoose population was back under control, instances of goat sucking then declined. Now, while this evidence is largely anecdotal, uh, I kind of like this explanation because it, it makes sense to me. Because it's kind of like, oh, you have a bunch of wild animals that suddenly get very hungry. And there's a bunch of animals that they can eat, and, like, most fences aren't going to defend against a mongoose. So, like, the mongoose, like, go hog wild on goats and chickens and shit like that. Because they're already predators, so, like, you know. How big's a mongoose? I'm trying to think, can a mongoose kill a... uh, Can a mongoose kill a goat? I don't know. Scavenges goat meat. Press to shake 20 mongo- Oh, mongooses hunt in packs. Mongooses yeah. can take goats down. Yeah. So, like, it's entirely possible. Um, they're, they're vicious little fuckers. Uh, so, yeah. Um, but Brandon, this doesn't explain the gray-like reptile, now does it? No, unless is it like several mongoose standing on each other's backs wearing a trench coat? I don't get it. It's worse. What do you mean it's, it's so worse? Much worse? How is it worse? It's so much. It is so much like that is hilarious, but and like patently insane 
the thing that actually is likely the cause of it? Let me just begin. So, Benjamin Ranford has what I would consider a pretty convincing uh, explanation in the form of a film starring Ben Kingsley okay. and Natasha Hendri- Henstridge, which is the 1995 classic Species. I saw Species. Yeah, so um, the film released in Puerto Rico on July 7th, 1995, just before... Madeline Tolentino had described the Chucacabra for the first time. Now, while her description matches no little living creature, it does, however, match the final alien form of Sill from the Species movie. Wait, what? Producer Roger Donaldson and Frank Manusco Jr. even noted the design of cre- of Sill in the design of Sill that the creature should either drink bone marrow or blood from its victims. And Brandon, just scroll down for a second because that's a screen grab from the species movies next to a picture of Chupacabra. But that, yeah, I think she just remembered Sill. <laughs> um. Now, now, like. That, they're so, like, oddly similar. They're for like sure. in, they're incredibly similar. Like here's a here's a not like blurry picture of it. Um, I'm gonna send it to you on uh, Discord. So like that's one pose of it, but like there's also this and like it's it's the the DNA oh, yeah. of the chupacabra is like deeply in. embedded. Yeah, like deeply embedded in the design of sill now you could say that you could say that oh they they were inspired by it but the fact of the matter is this design existed it was made by uh hg geiger like a year before the sighting happened because it was on film um now you also might say there's no guarantee that tolentino had seen the film however brandon Oh no. We know we know for a fact that she saw the film. How do you Tolentino states that she saw a movie called Species? Uh it would be a very good idea if you saw it. The movie begins here in Puerto Rico at the Arecibo Observatory. There's an experiment going on in the film, a girl in a glass box as a result of the experiment. When they try to kill her with poison gases, she breaks the box with supernatural strength. What came out from the inside of the girl made my hand stay on end. It was a creature that looked like the chupacabra with spines on its back and all. The resemblance to the chupacabra was really impressive. I watched the movie and wondered, my God, how can they make a movie like that when these things are happening in Puerto Rico? Uh, (laughs) Yeah, go. Go. That's bad. But... uh, So she saw... And then she... uh, Brandon, keep in mind that that last line, the, my God, how can they make a movie like that when these things are happening in Puerto Rico, strongly implies that she thinks that something like that is happening in Puerto Rico. Yeah. Brandon, this is not me just, like, making an assumption. She then follows it up. Um, So the, The the, uh, the, the interviewer asks this question. Does species make you think that there might have been an experiment in which a being escaped and now is at large in Puerto Rico. Tolentino responded, yes, but they managed to kill her in the movie. Uh, <coughs> that explains... So then, like... There's Tolentino, who clearly has... A, is connect Her ability to connect dots... I'll say is much better than everyone else's in that, oh boy, are those fucking things connecting dots that are way far away. But Brandon... And then people just ran with it. It gets even better, Brandon. Uh, She continues, Look, a journalist told me that El Junque, uh, jungle wildlife refugee in uh, Puerto Rico, said to be the Chupacabra's origin, was allegedly closed down because of the damage caused by Hurricane Hugo. He told me that the truth was that some experiment had escaped, not monkeys or anything like that. They never found those creatures. The journalist knows a lot about it because he's been researching it for a while. Brandon. Okay. There's 
so the chupacabra is the 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 reptilian version is conspiracy theorists saw species and went there it is one woman saw species and went there it is there's and maybe her journal the journalist might exist and be another and be another like her friend who's also and journalists might be like way like her friend journalist is a very like loose word that like a lot of people can call themselves journalists oh yeah no they're journalists the same way like every like QAnon person is a journalist is a researcher or wrote to an editor once on a newspaper yeah and it was put like so she saw it and went my god there it is yep. that's clearly has to be the thing yeah so as benjamin radford Ugh. notes this confabulation of friction fiction in real life casts doubts on her testimony and hurts her credibility as a witness yeah while she may have been a hoaxer it's additionally possible that she may have just been a victim of her own imagination like totally possible like yeah i, I wouldn't be so like and this is not me even like critiquing the woman like Everyone's a victim of their own imagination in some way. Yeah, I'm but inclined like, to say it's the latter based off of I think, just I don't think what she's we've a, seen. I don't think she's a hoaxer. I think she literally thinks that she saw the chupacabra, but it was. I think she like paradoyed it into existence. Now, regardless, Brandon, of its uh, weird-ass origins, the chupacabra has now entered the fabric of our reality. It's pervaded our popular media, media and captured the imaginations of people all over the world. Sightings of the chupacabra are practically worldwide now, and it's more or less become a cryptozoological meme. Like Bigfoot, the Wild Hunt, vampires, or countless other paranormal entities, the chupacabra has now become an excuse for the unexplained. Yeah. And that's all I have to say about the chupacabra. Very, because... I'm very happy. You, I don't think I could have done a chupy episode that would have gotten all that. It's that's weird, I applaud you. It's a weird cryptid and like I was thinking about attacking it from the perspective that we attack some of the other ones where we just go into like the sightings, but like it's one of those ubiquitous ones where like there's just so many sightings of it that it's like hard cuz it's not regionally locked like Nessie or Champ, right? Yeah. And it's, it's not everywhere. Bigfoot. It's not Bigfoot where there's like standout events that we could talk about. It's kind of like it's kind of like the the Guy Fox from uh V for De Vendetta, the Guy Fox mask from V for Vendetta style like thing where it's like everywhere but like it doesn't fucking matter anywhere. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's it's like it's like a historical footnote wherever it is a little bit. Like yeah, it's kind of weird too in that like it's so varied all over, like, but it, all the descriptions are individual and in that, like, yeah. it doesn't have what Bigfoot has going for it, where different regions are, have very regionally specific Bigfoots that yeah. all share the same description. There might be little clusters of this popping up, but none of them are, like... Yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah. the problem, the problem with Chupacabra is it's like it, it's basically the cloud equivalent of a cryptid, right? Yeah. Like it's there's no central server for the Chupacabra. It's like all over the fucking place. Yeah. And that's the real. That's the problem with the Chupacabra is like it's not like internally consistent, right? And it's. It's more of, like, an excuse. It's more of, like, an expletive than it is a c actual creature. Yeah, it's it's almost like Chupacabra, rather than being the descriptor of a specific creature or group of creatures, Chupacabra could just mean monster or creature on its own. Basically. Yeah. Basically. It's, it's, it's almost to that point, like, where it's, like, not really... It, it's not really, like, anything. It, yeah, it's so general that it stops describing things. It, It's like a generic copyright in that way, right? Like, yeah. it's like Band-Aids, right? Yeah, like exactly. It's kind of, it's, kinda, it's, it's like the Band-Aids of cryptids. Yeah, or Google. Or the, or the, uh, 
the Oreos of cryptids. Yeah, band aids. So. Uh, if you're in the south, it's the Coke. Because if you're in the south and you order a Coke, they'll be like, "So what do you want?" Because <laughs> for them, that's just fucking soda. <clears throat> yeah. Or like Google, because everyone's like, "Oh, Google it." They don't mean actually go to Google. They mean whatever your search engine of choice is. I never say that, but that's because I value the importance of language. <laughs> if I if I say Google it, I literally mean Google. Go to Google. You mean yeah, go to Google. Yeah, if I'm saying Google it, you are literally I'm literally asking you to go to Google. I'm not asking you to bing it. Who the fuck bings anything? Who if you bing it, you're a monster. If unless you, you're trying to get the unless you're trying to get the money that uh Microsoft gives you for binging things. Like if you bing a certain number of things, they'll give you money because they're that desperate to get people to use their platform. How it can't be a lot of tell what extent like a couple bucks a month you can get doing that. Cuz like if that's a real thing, then there are people who just wrote a script. Yeah. To oh, yeah. bing no. things to gain Oh yeah. a few oh, bucks. Yeah. No. I mean that's basically cryptocurrency. So like that's not even hard to do. I can't program or write anything, and I know I could do that. Like I know I could just create. Like you. Well, you have to. You have to bing document certain things. You have to bing specific things. A dictionary of words. Like you could literally just take the dictionary, and tell it to randomly search to randomly bing, anything, and then now, and now Microsoft sends you money. You have to bing specific things. Like, they give you missions. So. I I bet you could still, like, ignore their... Because I bet all of the missions are things that are good for Microsoft. True. Like, things that they would want a higher search frequency of. So if you know what that is, you could probably just compile your own list of shit to bing. Yeah. Um, but... Anywho. Um... I think it's time to bring this episode to a close. So, um, as always, our website is cryptopediacast.com. Our Instagram is at cryptopediacast. Our Twitter is also after cryptopediacast. Our email is cryptopediacast at gmail.com or us at cryptopediacast.com. Uh, we have a Patreon. And as always, we'd like to thank our Jackalope level supporters. So, thank you to Clay Sinclair, Marty Von Party, Bird Schneider, Jonathan Shepard, and fuck Andrew Jackson. Um, we have a Facebook group that I don't post anything in. If you have uh, monster requests or stories, be sure to send them in. Currently, Jersey Devil is on the backlog. Um, and Wendigo will be never be done. Uh, unless you can find me somebody who is like a part of Canada's indigenous population so I can talk to them about the Wendigo and like what the myth, what the myth of the Wendigo and like the story of the Wendigo means to them. But I'm not going to touch it otherwise. Um, mean especially because like there's recently been stuff about residential schools that's been popping up, so like it's even less okay for us to co cover it because like residential schools are like a part of that story. Um, <laughs> uh, if you enjoyed the podcast, be sure to rate, review, all that stuff. Um, I know it's hard because like for whatever reason, like podcasting apps don't let you rate and review anymore really other than like itunes it's very confusing yeah it's weird um yeah you can find me on instagram at donkey underscore hands my website is boyerb.com my email is brandon at cryptopediacast.com and his twitter his twitter my twitter is at crypto brandon my instagram is at mu2057 my twitter is at jf dunham my website is uh, johndunhamgames.com, and my email is john at cryptopediacast.com. Our art was done by Tom Hill. You could find him on Instagram at Thomas Michael Hill. His website is greatergloryco.com, and his email is tommikehill at gmail.com. As always, I'm John. I'm Brandon. And things are going to get weird. <laughs>